panel to start by introducing themselves. So John, would you like to go first? Thank you very much. Evening, everybody. I'm John Shaw from Chiltern Rangers. Um, I founded Chiltern Rangers in 2013. We're a spin out from the local authority at the time. Um, and we're all about communities and conservation. But there's a massive dovetail in with this uh, whole event starting this morning with uh, one of my colleagues discussions about foraging. Um, and obviously, lots of what Mr. Attenborough has just been talking about resonates strongly with us here in the Chilterns and uh, South Berkinghamshire. So yeah, be happy to talk about that in due course and take your questions. Thank you very much. And um, Garth, could I just ask you to introduce yourself, please? Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Garth Clark. I'm a States Director for the Wadston Estate and uh, I'm focusing at the moment uh, on our farming. So we have, a, we have about 6,000 acres in total. So we have a great opportunity to change our farming system to one that uh, is hopefully more sustainable. Great, thank you. And Lucy? Um, hi everybody, I also work with Becca and with Helena at Feedback. Uh, my role is Regional Feed Economies of the Northwest and we are working on a range of different um, projects and activities around circular economy, uh, reusing and repurposing food surplus and also uh, looking at issues of food justice and access to food. Great, thanks Lucy. And last but by no means least, Hannah. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah from Sustain. We've been funded by the Rothschild Foundation to look at the need for a food partnership for Buckinghamshire. So taking all of the issues around food from health, sustainability, livelihoods and so on, and everyone that has a stake in that, so pretty much everyone, but a cross-sector partnership and seeing if there's a need for everyone to work and to be collaborating together more and people have said yes. So the report has just been published and uh, I'm now working to set up that partnership and, and get some activity going in Bucks. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to start by asking a question. Um, one of the things that kind of was most uh, pressing in the film was this, this growing population. Um, and how do you think that our food systems will be able to adapt to accommodate for the growth in population um, going forward? So if I start with John on that question, um, it could relate to your local area or your local food system. Hi, thanks very much. Um, no pressure at all going first. Um, I, yeah, it's a it's a big question, isn't it? I think there's there's already lots of overproduction in the system. Um, we don't like to talk about it, but we know food waste is a massive problem. So one of the things that from a conservationist's point of view, which is the lens that I look at these things through, is how can we produce the food that we need in a way that's genuinely sustainable? One of the ways that we can do that, certainly here in the Chilterns, is taking um, land that's pretty poor for yields out of production and returning that to nature into a rewilding kind of sense or planting up or just managing as, as chalk grasslands rather than adding in loads of fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, inputs in farmer speak to the system just to get a, a crop um, with a yield that's, that's good enough to turn an income. Now, there are lots of economic pressures on that, but um, the new systems that are coming out in a post EU world may address those. I'm not, I don't know the ins and outs, I'm not a farmer, it's not my bag particularly, but there are lots of ways that we can address this. From my point of view also, there's lots of ways we can do more in the urban setting. Uh, lots of the work that Chilton Rangers does is in and around urban areas, and there's masses and masses of public realm open space that could be used far, far better. Um, and that can be from, from the growing of, of uh, things like sloes, so that's, black, that's blackthorn uh, and hazelnuts, through to other, other, other ways we can have much more in, in terms of community growing. I think there's lots of opportunities to do that and using our urban green spaces in a much more exciting and innovative way. Um, there's also a massive need for more pollination facilities. So that can, that can vary, that could be a, apple trees, which are brilliant, uh, obviously for, for pollinators through to pollinator corridors, while flower meadows, they all have a role to play. Um, and I think it's not a one, a one solution for everything, but I think it's using lots of different techniques, methods, um, and bringing that all together 
but we also have to tackle this big food waste problem too. Yeah, definitely. I think that um, you've raised some really interesting points there. And the one of the things that was quite alarming about the film was this kind of um, push towards uh, automation from, for increased production. Um, what did you think about that, Garth, as our resident farmer on the panel? I, I I think my feelings dovetail a lot with what John's saying. Um, I think we have to be careful to talk about too much um, industrialization because that's where we've gone already. And all the way through that, that film, they talk about diversity. And the one thing that they're going to achieve with uh, focusing on that industrialization is they will, they end up with less diversity. So for me, exactly what John has said is the low hanging fruit is looking at, or looking at our, as a, as a farming business, looking at our farming business and seeing exactly what changes we can make. So land that just because we happen to have a 600 horsepower tractor and it could plow every acre in every part of the country doesn't mean it should. Uh, and I think you only have to roll back to the second world war to really see where these pieces of land, they're not productive. You know, we throw more fertilizers, more pesticides on them. And we have to start looking through a lens of how could it help us to uh, return that land into what its natural format would be probably a wilding and how we could view that as a habitat. And if you have a patchwork of habitats, as exactly as John said, across the land, and so certainly for bucks, if you had that patchwork of um, habitats, that would have a positive effect on how we farm. And what I do know is farmers, we have all chosen a farming system that has made us absolutely superb at claiming subsidies. So if we, if we relearn, go back to almost the Second World War, look at how we farm, look at how we respect our land and stop almost grow, growing hydroponically, respect our habitats, I think we can create a farming system with healthy soils and nutrient dense food. And, and that's one of my concerns about this sort of vertical farm. It has a place and it definitely could use space that we're not using already. However, I wonder how nutri nutrient dense it is. We do know when you watch things like Kiss the Ground and uh, Fantastic Fungi, when something's grown in the ground, and Lady Eve Balfour said this, when something's grown in the ground and you've got healthy ground, you have healthy plants, you have healthy humans. And I'm not quite sure that we've sorted out the vertical farming and that more, more industrial farming. So uh, yeah, a lot of it sort of dovetails in with what John said. Mm. And I mean, it's not just kind of the food production aspect of it. There's also kind of the food supply chains and retails. Lucy, how do you think that food um, kind of supply chains and the retail operation should change to um, to accommodate for a more just food system? Well, that's a big question, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the first thing that we have to consider is, is, is we're not talking about food waste, we're talking about food surplus, um, because food is only wasted when it's completely inedible. So part of what we need to do is we need to have a a look at what we're actually producing. We need to think about how much we're producing of that food. And we also need to think about how that is distributed and sent around the country and elsewhere. One of the things that comes through very strongly when you look at um, a lot of the food redistribution that goes on, which uh, works through sort of other, through food redistribution charities like Fair Share, et cetera, et cetera, is the, incredible amount of the same thing that comes every week so there will be hundreds of thousands of butternut squashes being handed over to community groups there will be more bread than you can shake a stick at being handed over to community groups and there's a point where it's actually not that useful it's not that helpful and the question has to go back to the people who are producing and who are growing this and say why are you producing this much it's clearly not required could you reduce what you're producing and maybe put some of your energies into something else and that's part of that the other thing which you asked about which is about access to food one of the big problems we've got in the north um, is we have a lot of food deserts which have arisen because of changes in planning law because of the way in which the supermarkets 
markets have taken over in terms of where they're situated within cities, which has led to the closure of a lot of smaller spaces. It's made it very difficult for people if they don't have public transport or they don't have um, also jobs that allow them the time to go to these supermarkets to actually shop for food. And one of the things I've noticed has come up in the questions and answers about obesity. I would say that if you make it easier for people to access fresh nutrient dense food in the first place that immediately reduces the need to eat food that is less good for you and helps you to become healthier in the first place. Thank you Lucy and Hannah would you um, is there anything that you feel that anybody's kind of missed out from that question that you'd like to add to it? I mean well firstly I just want to say isn't David Attenborough is such a legend. I mean, it goes without saying, but he is wonderful. He's a fantastic teacher and he's such a great advocate for the natural world, so good on him. It feels like he's got bolder over time and he's really tackling these issues head on as his legacy. You know, it's lovely to see him with the gorillas, see him with the seal, see him releasing that platypus into the river. Um, he's so unselfconscious with it all and and you know I just thought some of the film was utterly devastating you know seeing that rainforest tree falling and his, the personal effect on him is just you know you can see that he really wants to get this message across he talks about it being his witness statement and and um, you know his vision for the future and I think that there's enough really good stuff in the film that we really should all share it and you know he's he's talking about important things I like that he's focusing on divestment because that's a really important way to move move our money into the right areas that we that we want to be supporting whether that's renewables or actually sustainable farming you know we need to put our money where where we want our lives to go really don't we and um i do agree with him on you know on lots of things the stewardship that awareness leads to care that our interlocking lives sustain each other so there's lots to agree with but um you know i think there's some some interesting stuff that people have touched on you know the population issue is only really an issue if you know as as everyone has been saying we're not using our resources wisely and if we're wasting our food for example um you know lots of scientists are saying that population is going to level off at 10 billion and you know I, I do agree that he's taken the right tack here in saying that it's all about making sure as, as many people as possible can get out of poverty but I think some people who use David Attenborough's sort of words use that to have what I, a different view on population, which seems to be very blamey and kind of is quite a kind of colonizers blaming indigenous people or colonizers blaming the global south for population problems when, you know, when, when, when we're the ones who've, who've kind of de- you know, underdeveloped those countries and, and made sure that people are in poverty in those countries. So, you know, I, I'm glad that he took that tack um, in in the film, but I think, you know, population is is kind of one area that people use to to kind of shift the blame, I think. And 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 the other one is is needing to produce more food, which actually we produce plenty of food for 10 billion people already. It's just that we're not using it well. And the folks at Feedback and other places are doing fantastic work trying to get us to, to, to take more responsibility for that. So, you know, so that's 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 one thing anyway. And then, you know, like, um, like Garth was saying, this focus on, on rewilding from my point of view is really fantastic in areas with rainforests when we absolutely should be replanting rainforests as they have done in Costa Rica but I think in in this country actually rewilding ends up forcing you with food production down the route of a techno solution and when you've got a techno solution the big question is always who's in control you know, 80% of farmers on this planet are still small scale farmers. It doesn't feel like it, but but they are. And, um, you know, there's a lot of problem with control over seeds and 
machinery and all kinds of things like that. And if you if you rewild vast swathes of the countryside, you end up with, I guess, things like lab grown meat, which may not be a problem in their own um, case, but who's got the patent? And that really worries me. And, and I think we all need to retain the ability, like John was talking about, to, to, to grow our own food and to harvest our own food and so on. So for me, you know, the techno solutions aren't necessarily away from a, you know, from a kind of control point of view. Um, yeah, I mean, I could, I could say, <laughs> I could say lots more about biodiversity. I think Garth hit, hit the nail on the head really with, um, you know, if, if, if you're looking at these sort of, you know, in sustainable intensification in the Netherlands, that's not diverse at all. That's not biodiverse at all. And really to address this problem from a food and farming point of view, we need a diversity of solutions. And in this country, that probably looks like small mixed farms, uh, agroforestry, agroecology in general, working with the soils, with the land, with the landscape, with pollinators and so on. Um, and, you know, I think government has a, a really important role to play in this. We've got an opportunity with Brexit to change the subsidy system. I know Garth is keen to move away from subsidies, but, you know, the, the example in Costa Rica where their, for, their um, rainforest went to a quarter and uh, through subsidies has gone, gone back up to a half of what it, uh, of what it was. Um, you know, I think I think this government needs to be uh, rewarding farmers who are doing the absolute best of working, you know, supportively and in partnership with nature. And there is an opportunity there. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll say more later about what we could be doing in Bucks. I know that John's talked on that a bit. Thanks, Hannah. And I'd just like to remind everybody who's watching that they can post their own questions in either the chat box or in the question box. Um, and you can ask them yourself if you'd like to as well. We've got a question from Jess, who is asking how to maintain a positive outlook um, when we're faced with, you know, climate change and biodiversity loss. And she would like to ask Garth specifically how you've gone about assessing what needs to change on the farm estate to make it more sustainable. So Garth, would you like to let us know how you maintain a positive outlook if you have one and um, how you're making changes? Yeah, um, I maintain a positive outlook by um, believing that if we make the right choices, uh, for a farming system that those right choices will end up in a sustainable farming system. So for instance, on the estate here, I'm using 20 to 30 years of experience. And, and often that experience comes with talking to people who, uh, you know, it could be my father, it could be my grandfather. It could be actually when I've been traveling, I took a, a lot of, um, a lot of inspiration from uh, a trip to uh, South America and, and I suddenly realized these indigenous people really knew how to farm. It's very simple farming. Um, and if we focus on doing the right thing, we'll ultimately end up doing the right thing. Uh, we need to sort out our terminology in terms of what subsidies are or what grants are. And the government need to reward farmers for, for good farming practices. And very often you don't have to look much further than your small family farms to find out really good farming. You know, they're really good. By default, they've become mixed farms because they can't afford a loss in any one year for too much rain or bad wheat prices or bad beef prices or bad land prices. So they have become diverse. And what that has then produced is a diverse farming system that is better for the land. So for, for me, uh, I've, I've spent 20 years organic farming. Um, I actually find that slightly um, restrictive now. What I want to do, as, as I had 10 years working for the Yo Valley business, and what uh, the Mead family taught me was that we have to make good, nutritious food affordable. And if we're going to do that, then nutritious food has to come from the land. Uh, and if it's going to come from the land, we've got to look after the soil. And if it's going to come from the soil, we've got to first repair the soil, which organics teaches us as we can do. Uh, and we then have to have the business um, the business 
uh, commercial view to make it as affordable as possible, because uh, then it's open to everybody rather than it being um, an elite. And, and just to pick up on a couple of other things, when we do have all of these products coming through and we don't recognize them, it, you know, today I've been cooking up chicken bones to make a broth. I, I'm amazed at how many people don't know how to do these things. And I've been really inspired by some of the work by Hubbub where communities have learned what to do with a butternut squash or have learned what to do with a certain vegetable. Um, and that I find um, superb. Certainly, we do a lot of um, things around education, around food, and it definitely we found when it comes to food waste makes a massive, or food surplus usage, it makes a massive difference. John, I noticed that you would like to pitch in there. Please go, feel free. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think with all these things, the word that always I return to is actually balance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we've, we've lost balance in lots of different ways. Our landscapes are not in balance our food production and all these systems are, are completely out of kilter things and that can be in lots of different ways again so it might be a, a return or an emphasis perhaps on seasonality um with with seasonality becomes you know a way that we can not not have to move all of the produce all around the country we can make use of those local farms that Garth was talking about and, and really, you know, produce local and consume local. I think that's a really important thing going forward in terms of protecting the soils. We know that there are only a limited amount of harvests left in our soils due to the pressure we've put on them. So, you know, from a, again, with a conservationist uh, eye on things, I'm all for massive, uh, you know, uh, buffers and boundaries around fields, to the margins essentially that keep, the soil uh, looked after rather than being washed down the country lanes and you see this happen quite quite a lot of the time hedgerows are really important and undervalued and uh, we've ripped them all up by the hundreds of thousands of miles actually in the last 60 70 years or more so i'm a big advocate for putting hedges back it does loads of good things it puts it sequesters carbon in the form of the the hedges themselves it provides habitat for some of our most declining farm and bird species like tree sparrows and yellow hammers and things like this um, and actually by restoring the balance and along the lines of the sorts of things that we've heard Garth speak of as well I think that these these are the kinds of things we need to to look to 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 move things forward but just to pick up the question initially I'm an eternal optimist and positive person um, and I think that it's not a question of of uh, what if we don't it's a question of we have to we have to make these changes um and there are loads of different ways we can do that david attenborough made the blue planet and the blue planet 2 programs so we know about the challenges to uh, to the plastic in the water and the water the plastic in the water gets there through us using plastic in the first place so it's not just about food and food waste and, and food surpluses and the unequal distribution of food it's about how that food is packaged as well um, you know, the fact is that, you know, cucumbers don't need to be wrapped in cellophane um, and then put in a box wrapped in cellophane and put in a box wrapped in cellophane. For example, there's loads of others that you can give. They're an easy one. Um, the supermarkets always tell you, oh, they last longer. Well, don't buy three cucumbers, buy one if that's what you need in the in the week's shelf life that they've got. So along with all of these things, there's a huge piece on education. And I know that that's something that Becca and your team are looking at doing. Yeah, definitely. And as Phil has asked, you know, can we can non technological solutions adapt to kind of combat climate change? Or do we really need a lot more technological innovation to be able to make the changes needed? Um, would anybody in particular like to answer that question? <laughs> I, I'd, I'd like to just pick up on it. For me, uh, in agriculture at the moment, technology is is a huge a part of what everybody's talking about. I'm a great believer that we haven't yet focused on the soil enough uh, before we start using robots just to go around using lower rates of pesticides. Uh, how about we look at how the soil could be managed, uh, get that soil health up, and, and you'll pick it up this with this from the, the film uh, Fantastic Fungi. That soil health, you know, in a, in a teaspoon of soil, it's often said there's more life in a teaspoon of soil than there are humans on the planet today. And that's got to be a healthy soil. So if we, if we get that soil healthy, and that's one thing we've looked at at the estate here, is taking part of our, our waste products, if it's you know, trees that we would normally have cut down and then taken the tops off and left them, but we're making that into a compost. 
we're rearing our own um, microorganisms to be able to, so it was, we're almost giving, uh, giving our soil um, a, a, a bit of a kick uh, of, of, um, of microorganisms just to get it back into life, just the same as you would if you take an antibiotic and uh, you, you, you took some um, yogurt. Uh, I, I really think we need to focus on what the soil can do first uh, and, and work alongside that, the innovation that's possible. Mm. Um, we also have a question that Lucy alluded to earlier from Ivan that was talking about obesity being a problem. How can we work with uh, our local food systems to improve our health? Um, I know that there's a lot of concern around um, NCDs, so non-communicable diseases through over hormone use um, and, and also, you know, heart disease and obesity through eating kind of the wrong things. Hannah, would you mind, um, would you be interesting to speaking about that yeah absolutely I think um you know it's something that's really top of all of our minds at the moment with the COVID crisis and for some people it's been uh, a real wake up but ultimately you know we've been surrounded by what people call the obesogenic environment for a long time haven't we and I think um one of the things we have to be a bit careful of is looking at obesity as the problem um because actually it's um it's more about what is it that's causing obesity that's the problem um otherwise it just becomes too big an issue or too personal and directed at individuals um and for me from a food point of view kind of availability prevalence and government support for huge amounts of sugar is the problem rather than obesity as such so you know, we, we in this country, we grow an awful lot of sugar beet, a lot of which we support to the developing world. And, you know, and, and that's still subsidised by government. So, you know, even in this COVID world where we're saying that we all need to, um, you know, be taking more care of our health than we ever had, we're, we're, we've got this very, very cheap very addictive substance that we're putting into absolutely everything and that is is very very freely available and in terms of our the, the food that we have available to eat you know it it, it costs an awful lot to eat a nutritious diet compared to a diet that's full of food that's high in fat sugar and salt so you know i'm not saying that uh, most of the population can afford to add to their food bill but you know we need to rebalance the cost of a, a basket of food so that the fruit and the vegetables and the healthy stuff hopefully grown in a really uh, sustainable potentially organic way that improves soil health you know that's what needs to be the cheapest part of the basket with the the fat sugar and salt you know is, is is something that people only have occasionally so i think that you know i think we need to focus on you know which things are the, the causes of obesity and from a, a local environment point of view i mean i think there's there's stuff about individual behavior change which is a hard one to for any anyone who's tried to lead a healthy lifestyle you kind of it comes and goes doesn't it and you fall off the wagon and you get back off back on again um, but the, the environment can support that. And, you know, locally, there's a lot we can do to uh, address things that Lucy was talking about, like food swamps where there's too much sugar and salt and fat and uh, food deserts where you have to go miles to get to, you know, the nearest grocery store or fresh fruit and veg or whatever. So there is stuff that we can do within our, you know, local environment, maybe through the planning system or through local authorities giving rent or rates cuts to healthy food shops. And then there's things we can do, ad, uh, campaigns and so, what, so on in schools and you know, locally education. Um, but there's, uh, there's, yeah, there's also, I think something that John was talking about, which is about just creating the environment where a good food culture just exists. And that makes for a really supportive, um, you know, really supportive place where you can live and work and grow up and learn and so on and be healthy. And, you know, and that can be done through 
things like community growing projects, cooking projects where we cook and eat together, you know, the, all the things that have come up in COVID where community groups have stepped up to the mark and started delivering healthy ready meals to people who can't get out who are self-isolating. So, you know, there's lots and lots that we can do on a community basis locally. There's some really important things that local governments to do can do. And then there's some vital things that national policy needs to do that we can kind of advocate for and, and push that up to a national level. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I'll just pass over to Lucy, who I think wants to comment on the same point. Yeah, I did. I, I, I just wanted to raise something that, that's come up from a couple of people about making it cheaper. And I, I don't think that's the answer at all. I think I think in we actually have a have to look at the bigger picture, which is that a lot of people are not paid sufficiently to live well. And the issue of poverty is a major driving factor in what what enables people to eat well or to live well and if we push the price of food down too far because at the moment it is artificially low for many um for many producers then that has a knock-on effect on the people who are a producing the food but also the people who are growing the food who are transporting the food who are putting the food into the supermarkets and into the shops it's no coincidence that a lot of supermarket workers have to go to their own food banks because they're not paid sufficiently because everything is sort of dumbed down all the time so I just want to be a little bit cautious about this idea of making food cheaper I don't think that's necessarily the answer the answer is more about making it more available and I think what John was saying previously about going for the seasonal aspect is definitely one to look at because if we think about the amount of choice that you find within a supermarket it, it's not really necessary to have strawberries imported into December but we can have citrus fruit which is at that time is the time when you should be eating it and getting people to understand and use local produce more i mean helena you saw the amount of apples that we've had donated to the alchemic kitchen in the last in the last couple of months i think we've probably gone through something like a ton of apples that were otherwise just going to waste but at the same time we're now seeing apples from new zealand being imported into our shops and you kind of go hello there's something a little bit wrong there so i just wanted to raise that point about we have to make sure that people can make a living from the food that they're producing and making. Yeah, and I just want to respond to Lisa because I hope you didn't think that I was saying that food needs to be cheap. And my husband runs an apple juice business, and my goodness, it's hard to hard to make a living. And yeah, I completely agree with you that you know if people uh, work doesn't pay, benefits aren't livable on, and people are spending you know vast quantities, sometimes up to seventy percent of their income on rent. So those kind of big systemic problems are the reason why people are having to, you know, are, are, are trying to squeeze their budgets and squeeze their budgets and food is the thing that often has to give. So yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Can I just add to that quickly as well? The other thing is we, we should be aware as growers that it's a lot of the inputs that cost us the money. Um, and, and what I'm trying to do is way move away from those inputs so they're farmer controlled, not chemical company controlled, uh, not third party controlled so it's you're right it's it's about making it better value uh, and that small smaller farmers can supply locally and uh, and produce a better better value crop without relying on chemicals because we know that if we just have robots spraying our fields the cost of the chemicals going to go up net net we're going to end up the same we've got to try and do without these these um, these guys selling us chemicals and fertilizers Great. And for the benefit of um, everybody who's watching, how, from a, a practical standpoint, can people in your area go about accessing locally sourced seasonal produce? Um, so if I could just ask John, do you have any recommendations for viewers? Slightly out of my of my sort of comfort area, if I'm totally honest, but I think I think there are some some really broad principles that we can do. Um, before before I address that, I just want to quickly, if I may, indulge me just going back to Garth's point and Lucy's point. I think one of the problems we've got is that the profit from the whole supply chain is hoiked out by massive supermarket chains and massive. Um, they're pet petrochemical and pharmacochemical type organisations, and actually 
they are the root of a lot of the problem because we, we all are beholden on unto them. And I think again, just a shout out for your local farm shops. I, I personally use it literally 250 yards down the road. I've got a, a green grocer. I think that whole local um, economy stuff is really, really valuable. I think we, we need to really look at that more. Also it reduces our own f food miles and the miles that we travel to get it. Um, and actually it's not, that expensive um and also they'll often do sort of um they'll do you know good deals at the end of the day and, and things like that so there are ways that we can make these things uh, good value for us and for the people who are selling it um through the whole supply chain so there's there's that as well in terms of stuff that happens in the local area um i'm a big fan frankly of things like um, community type allotments and gardens and, and coming together as communities to produce things i think there's lots of mileage that we can uh, gain from that um, that goes hand in glove with seasonality but also growing stuff that's that works well in our local areas you know looking at the soil and what will our soil produce um, and also then looking at organic fertilizers basically you know sort of locally sourced manures and things like that to increase the nutritious content of that soil uh, as possible as much as possible rather than um, using chemicals I think that there's no there's no doubt in my mind that those are some of the more sustainable ways uh, of doing these things and actually the, the less we put chemicals in our systems across the piece for all sorts of different reasons I think that's got to be a good thing um, but also the other point about local and communal grown stuff is the social element that you get from it working together um, you know coming together as a community there's a hell of a lot of additional value that you, that you can get from that um, and that's something that I certainly value um, but there's also lots of ancillary things um, one of the big one of the big beefs in my world is actually bamboo canes bizarrely we spend loads of money as a as a country importing bamboo canes from the other side of the world when we've got hazel that grows locally in all of our woodlands and this hazel needs coppicing on depending on various different things between 10 and 15 years it needs coppicing and we can use this hazel instead of bamboo canes and do you know what by doing that the woodlands are in better condition and some of the rare butterflies will survive the birds will nest because the coppice habitat will grow back it's really about getting back in touch with the, some of the traditional things that have stood us instead for many many hundreds and hundreds of years which we've lost touch of as david attenborough said in the film we've really lost touch in this drive for mass production and industrial scale production and in many ways we can we know we can do it really well in that local kind of environment so like i say coppicing is brilliant we can produce uh, steaks and and canes pea sticks all kinds of things and have that benefit for biodiversity i think there's a, one of the film one of the themes from the film that i picked up on um is the interconnectedness between us and our biodiversity we've lost that we've lost this connection with nature uh, and how the natural systems function and i think that however we get in that back whether that's through food whether that's through local pro produce um, that's not for food so uh, anything made of timber for example you know, these are the things that we really got to focus on. Um, and I think if we do that as a, as a community, then we've got a real good chance of, of undoing some of this negative stuff that we've experienced in recent years. And it certainly feels like there's a lot of um, kind of community uh, spirit at the moment. Um, everything that we're going through at the moment is forcing us to ask questions about um, the way that we've been living our lives, not just because of COVID, but also because of like the press, pressing issues uh, posed by climate change. And Lucy, I know that you wanted to um, add to um, ha what people can practically do uh, to access well, food. Uh, well, this, this was partly prompted by the comment that Phil has made in, in the questions and answers about emphasising going back to eating seasonal food. And I've been uh, working on a, on a bit of research with Lancaster and Leeds universities to look at the procurement um, landscape around anchor institutions such as universities, schools, hospitals, etc., and where they're buying their food from. And one of the things that's come through quite strongly is that there is, a, excuse the pun, an appetite amongst procurement uh, managers to purchase more locally but they don't actually know whom they can go to. They don't have an understanding of what the local sort of food supply chain might be. 
and they're also recognizing that they probably have to think differently about what it is that they are purchasing so we've talked a wee bit about something called a northern menu the idea being that instead of focusing on things like rice we'd be looking at using oats because we can grow those much more easily than we can grow rice um, even though you'd think with the climate that we have up here we would do really well with rice but um, it's looking at that it's thinking about using beans and pulses much more in our diets than always relying on meat as a protein source you know there's been some brilliant work done by Hodmodods about you know sort of re resurrecting some old varieties of pe beans and peas etc I mean we use them a lot during lockdown when we were making soups for the community because it was a way of being able to bulk out our vegetable soups and make them really kind of hearty and tasty and so that sort of area is something I'm really interested in from a farming perspective as well in terms of you know I know it's a risk to maybe change what you're doing Garth but is that something you might you might think about? I've seen a I've seen like a, um, a really interesting movement in in America called chaos crops, which is where smaller where farms near cities or near towns set aside a small area of growing, i.e. a field or half a field, and grow specifically a range of vegetables for the local market rather than just for the wholesale market. And I just wondered if there was any, you know, sort of like interest or possibility of maybe going down that route a little bit? Undoubtedly, uh, in, in the, the new rotations that we're looking at here, um, as, uh, as, as John has said, with um, forestry, we're looking at how we can better utilise our forestry. I would encourage people to eat less meat, but better quality, so they know where it came from. Um, and, and beans and pulses, again, it's, it's one of those things was, we've got to go right back because we have produced a farming system that is barn filling. So we, we take big tractors out into the field, we harvest our cereals, we put it into the store and we sell it to the highest bidder. If I wanted to start um, modeling exactly what Hobmodods are doing, which is a fantastic business case, we would really struggle. We don't have the segregation in the grain stores. Um, we would have to look at how we clean our grain, but it's definitely what we've got to do. Absolutely 100% and look at that diversity, look at how we can provide more food to the local community and then you know i i would reach out to to everybody else and, and talk about the education you know how can we take a um a less well-known cut of meat and know how to cook it better you know dried beans look dreadful the hodmodod packs look great but actually a dried bean you need to know what to do with to make it something that's tasty and um, and there's cultures out there we're surrounded by cultures that really know how to do this well and we we should we should embrace that and look to these cultures to say, look, how can we take a, a marrow fat pea? I've grown marrow fat pea for years. They've all, they're all exported. You know, they, I've just put some in a bowl now. I've got to soak them for 24 hours. We need education. We really do. Um, and then um, my belief is after the years with Yo Valley is supermarkets will, supermarkets can't afford to put things on their shelves that they can't sell. So if, if the consumers go into supermarkets, and I would prefer that they go to small, I've done all my shopping this year, this, this weekend at the local butcher, the local greengrocer, go into those places and say, I would like to see some beans. If you keep asking and people keep repeating it, they will put it on the shelves. I'm absolutely certain of it. Thanks, Garth. And Hannah, I know you wanted to mention um something about the last point too. yeah and it's a great leading guff because you know if people are wondering how do i go about doing this locally this question about farm shops is is really good and we are lucky we're a, a county of farm shops there's a lot of them but the important thing and i think feedback will like this from a food citizenship point of view is to really engage with with that farm shop you know get to know people and don't be afraid to ask questions you know, um, it, it's important for you to know where your food comes from and, 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 and hopefully they'll be willing to, to reply. And that's the only way really that you'll know that it's coming from the kind of production system that we want to see where, you know, we're, we've got high animal welfare and the farming system is putting, um, you know, um, fertility back into the soil, working with biodiversity, working with insects and so on and 
and you know it, it kind of takes asking those difficult questions and, and asking for the things that we want in those farm shops to to make that happen same with the farmers markets and just um you know having those relationships a, a few there have been a few a few questions i think in the in the chat that have been really interesting about you know do we need to just eat seasonally and we only get to eat cabbages for this part of the year and in a way I, I guess I'd say yes you know because then when it comes to sweet corn season it's really exciting and it, when it comes to tomato season it's really exciting and it, and it, it completely changes um, our relationship with food but you know I, I think from a kind of local sourcing point of view I always I like the um, the model from a group called Growing Communities in London where they basically say that we should be sourcing most of our food from let's say Bucks and the surrounding counties and maybe the UK and then some from it from Europe and then the treats and the things like sugar and coffee and tea just small amounts globally obviously shipped in to to reduce um, the emissions from transport and I, I think it's 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 great if we can start thinking in that way that we want to source from our local producers and we want to support them to do the right thing and to be farming in a way that gives us a livable planet for the for the long term future. Um, you know, I think that the question about population and dis fair distribution and so on also has to kind of hang on local food systems because um, yes, there's stuff that we can do globally, but if we're doing it in an unethical way, then we're leaving other societies short on some of their staples and you know you end up with a situation that we've got in in lots of countries at the moment where where things that we've kind of said are super foods in this country like quinoa and things that are really um desirable like avocado they end up being um produced and sold at a premium and produced in an unsustainable way um and t taking it away from local communities where it's a, an indigenous crop and and you know and, and if we're to reinstate a fairer food system then we need to be very very careful about that kind of activity where you know where we're, we're kind of um we're we're robbing other other communities of, of their staples um yeah i mean uh how do we how to stay positive um I guess uh, be aware of the issues, but work where you have power and empowerment. And you know that may well be that you're working nationally and changing national policy, or it may well be that you're doing something with your local school or growing vegetables in in a community garden. And those are all really vital things, and we all need to be doing our bit to create this um, wonderful you know, world for the future that we want to pass on to the next generation. Definitely. Um, and I think that we're coming to the end of our session. Um, so I'm going to launch a poll now, which is just going to ask you about how you feel that you have been affected by watching the film and watching the planet. So uh, the planet, the, f <laughs> the film and the panel. Um, so I'll launch that now. And if the and everybody could just fill that in and I'll just ask the panel uh, once they've done that to ha leave um, their closing remark. So um, Garth, would you like to go first? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I've said everything that I, uh, I wanted to say. I, I really do this is believe this is about supporting local. Um, we have to bear in mind that there will always be parts of the country that better suited because of their land types for milk production or vegetable production but when we start to understand our land and the layout of our land there will always be waste bits of land or parts of a farm that could be used for vegetables or something else so educating people in how to use these seasonality um, and making season seasons more exciting as, as i was saying to you earlier by by understanding how different cultures use the rather plain things that we can grow here you know, we really can grow these dried beans that people like Cotton Dodds are growing. Um, and we as farmers cannot, we cannot, we must not continue to monocrop with just wheat after wheat after wheat, maybe put some rape in there. You know, that's not going to work for us. We've got to have that diversity of rotation 
and and if we're going to do that you know I'm, I'm a great my, I'm allowed to say this because my father's a farmer and he does lean on the fence and shout get off my land um, and we need you know we need people to talk to us and find out what they want farmers we've got to start listening and uh, we've got to start uh, getting support from the government for doing the right thing and, and that's how I, I hold my hope uh, we, we focus on the things we really want to achieve and, uh, and, and really stop focusing on everything we don't want. It's, our, our minds are much better at looking at all the things that we really want to achieve. And, uh, and that comes much easier to us. Thank you. Great. And John, any closing statements from you? I think the biggest thing is that we can make a difference. We can choose where we buy things from and what we buy. We can also change change things in terms of giving a hand locally and that might be giving a hand with a conservation organization looking after local woodland and the benefits that that will bring i agree with garth that we need to put pressure on those who have power and authority uh, government is one local authorities are another there are lots of things that they can be doing i think the way that public realm spaces are managed could be so much more for biodiversity and for local communities um, and so i think that we just have to take the messages from the video this evening and from the discussion and realize that the power is in our hands and our wallets it's how we choose to spend our money how we choose to spend our time ultimately that will determine the positive or negative outcome of everything we've talked about tonight great thanks john and hannah do you want to leave a closing remark i think that's it from me <laughs> lucy have you got anything to add that you feel we've missed out um I think just just keep focusing on being a citizen for food rather than just a passive consumer. Ask the questions, be a bit awkward and keep demanding access to the best and the freshest and uh, try and try and educate yourself and others around you as well. Great. Okay. So looking at the poll, everybody seems to be very optimistic. We've got lots of people who are inspired, lots of people who are eager to learn more, and lots of people who want to share the message that they've heard tonight with others. Um, I hope that we got to all of the questions that you had, and this video will be available if you want to share it. Thank you so much for attending. And yeah, that's it for tonight. You can enjoy the rest of your Saturday night <laughs> in peace. <laughs> Thank you very much.